UFC Louisville was kind of a mess. We had a bad stoppage in the main event. We had a couple of sketchy scorecards, some weird game plans, and six of 14 fights ended with the underdog winning. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks, and I'm going to recap the entire UFC Louisville fight card. But before we talk about the fights, let's talk about the bets. Overall, the bets were okay. We avoided some landmines. There were some giant landmines on this card. I mentioned six of 14 fights ended with the underdog winning. That is a wild percentage. Keep in mind, underdogs are supposed to lose. That's why they're underdogs. Every single female fight, the underdog won. There wasn't a single favorite female that won on this card. If we look at the bets, Ludovic Klein, Muddy Line, I should have been heavier on that. I put a half a unit on that. I did that last week. If you're a premium member, you got that well before this card. And I just felt great about that. It felt like Tiago, Tiago Moises is just an old era. And he's not an old guy. He's only 31, but he's just a different era of fighter. We'll talk about that fight. Bruno Fajeda and Rayan Dos Santos, I parlayed them. I parlayed them. And there was the mistake. We'll talk about Rayan Dos Santos. We'll talk about Rayan Amanda. That was a bad decision. I think she won that fight, but it doesn't matter because she had the worst game plan we have ever seen. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then I had Tiago Moises, Ludovic Klein over two and a half rounds. That hit. Jared Cannonier win inside the distance. Decision, no action. Jason Herzog took that money from us. He reached into our pocket and took that money. He said, you know what? This is probably going to a decision. Let me take that from them. And in all likelihood, Jared Cannonier was rocked. He wasn't a hundred percent but his hands were up he was defending he didn't fall down he wasn't being held up by the fence he was standing up on his own accord defending himself and throwing bombs back by all by all means that was a bad stoppage does it mean that it wasn't going to get stopped and he wasn't going to get put out in 30 seconds i don't know but right then and there that was a bad stoppage we'll talk about that and then the safety parlay hit it's on a little bit of a roll the safety parlay is a premium member only bet and yes it was juiced minus 210 but how good does that look now on a card like this with six underdogs winning with fights going to a decision that people didn't expect and other fights getting finishes that people didn't expect this safety parlay of Brad Katana with the Montana De La Rosa and Andrea Lee over two and a half parlayed. I mean, that was as good as gold, but bets weren't the only thing that did well. Our prize picks and our underdog fantasy absolutely crushed. They dominated. We always do. We always do. We always do the flexible payouts because this sport is wild. The Ludovic Klein, 52 and a half significant strikes. The more on that hit on both. Eduardo Mora, two and a half takedowns. The more on that hit on both. Julian Marquez was the only one I lost here, but we do that flexible payout. Bruno Fajeda finished and Tiago Moises did not. Both of these crushed. They have been crushing. If you do want to play these games, these are daily fantasy games. You don't need to be in a legal betting state to do it. If you want to play these games, head over to our website. They'll give you some free money and you can hop on in. And then finally, the DraftKings ownership again, week in and week out was the best on planet Earth. Not only did we have the best DraftKings ownership on the planet, the margin between us and second place was astronomical. Astronomical. If you want to unlock the safety parlay, the picks, the bets, and everything else for UFC Vegas 93, you can do so now. Just go to wewantpicks.com. It is freaking $10 an entire month. UFC 303 is included in that. UFC Abu Dhabi is included in that, as is UFC Vegas 93. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's $10 for an entire month for all our picks, our bets, and access to every single thing that we do. Let's talk about the fights. This was my reaction to that decision. And while this is a little overstated, because I don't think this was the worst decision we've ever seen, this wasn't horrible, this wasn't protest esque type decision, I do think it was an incorrect decision. Puja Tamar did nothing. All she did was throw out a sidekick. That's it. And one of those sidekicks happened to knock down Ryan Amanda, Ryan Dos Santos. One of those sidekicks knocked her down. But it was just a push to the gut and she stumbled backwards. The entirety of the fight, the rest of the fight, was Ryan moving forward and throwing strikes. Moving forward with Puja backing up, getting hit three to one. Puja was getting hit left and right and just threw out a sidekick every now and then. And she got the decision. I'm not a conspiracy person. I am not. I always say the conspiracies are ridiculous. The commissions don't work for the UFC. The commissions are basically government employees. But at the end of the day, it's a little, it's a little iffy that the first Indian female fighter, the person the UFC is probably going to want to push, got somewhat of a gift decision. That was not a good decision. The scorecards on that were wild. 
30-27 one way, 30-27 the other way, and 29-28. Those are wild scorecards. Yes, this was a close fight. I'm not calling this a travesty by any means because while Rayan was just marching forward doing whatever she wanted to do, that little knockdown helped Pooja, and Pooja would yell. She's got that Caitlyn Chagagian bullshit. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And somehow that tricks people into thinking something meaningful is happening because Ryan Amanda outlanded her. She was the one moving forward. She did fail three takedowns, but she attempted them. And when I say you can't fight for them, actually, that's Jacob's big thing. I can't fight for these people. The fact that Ryan wasn't all in on the grappling is absurd. She got a leg, picked it up. Oh, it didn't work. I quit. That's absurd. She should have marched forward, shot legs, worked takedowns, and just absolutely Nurmaga made off her way to a win here. The gap on the ground is tremendous. But she hung around for a striking match. We got some tennis noises out of Pooja, and she stole a very close, albeit incorrect, decision. And then Taylor Lapalus showed us that there are sort of levels to technical striking. Taylor Lapalus is very good. He won this fight with straight-up technique. This wasn't a dog fight. He didn't win with power. He didn't win with just like raw athleticism. And he was the more athletic, faster, but it was technique. The reason he looked so much faster in there is because he was stepping off at the exact right moments, throwing at the exact right moments, doing exactly what he was supposed to do when he was supposed to do it. Taylor Lapalus is good. He's technical. He is kind of boring. He is kind of boring, but he is good. He's technical and he strikes when he's supposed to strike. There's not any wasted effort there. Cody Stamen had a, had a moment of success. He had a little bit of a takedown, had some forward pressure, some aggression, but ultimately didn't get it done. He was just a step behind in the striking, and that gap was far too wide to squeak out a decision. I, I do want to see Tara Lapalus fight somebody that will just absolutely dog him. And Cody kind of did that a little bit, but I want to see somebody that stays in his face, marches forward. Doesn't let him be technical and step off. Doesn't let him be low volume. Just stays in his face, runs right down the middle, and brings the fight to him. But so far, Terry Lapalus has looked good. He's looked good. He's technical. He's got that controlled style, and it is absolutely working for him. Then we had another female underdog win. We had Eduardo Mora taking on Denise Gomes. Denise Gomes was the underdog. A 3-1 to one underdog. 3-1 to one underdog. And she won this fight. And she earned this fight. Nothing sketchy here. No weird scorecard. She earned this fight. She earned this win. And she is a dog. First of all, she almost won with a guillotine right off the rip. That guillotine was insanely tight. Eduardo Mora shot a takedown against the cage. And then Denise Gomes just pulled that right up. It was under. It was tight. She was leaning. She held on to it for a while. Never needed the pull guard. Was just holding it and pulling and I thought she was going to get it. And I was nervous because we had the Eduardo Mora takedown lines and prize picks and underdog. And then somehow she did lose it. I was surprised she lost that. And essentially she stayed tough. She won this fight just purely off of toughness and grit. Because Eduardo Mora is a weight bully. Eduardo Mora relies on her size. She just wants to bully people, push them around. She was significantly larger in the cage. We know she missed weight, obviously. But she slowed down. And Denise Gomes did not slow down. Denise Gomes continued to move forward, continued the fight, continued to tough it out, and she won this decision because of it. And it is insane to me. I will never understand fighters who aren't in phenomenal shape. It is your job. This is your entire job. It's in your entire job. Being in shape is the easiest thing you can do. Being in shape requires no God-given talent whatsoever. You don't have to be tall to be in shape. You don't have to be fast to be in shape. There's no God given. You don't have to have a good chin. You don't have to do good at jujitsu. You don't have to be a good wrestler. You don't have to have any skills to be in shape. You just have to hit the pavement and run. You just have to get rounds in and work hard. And Eduardo Mora, not in shape, faded way too early in this fight. I'm sure the weight cut had something to do with it, but that's your fault, missing weight. No excuses for people who get tired that early in fights. But Denise Gomes is a dog. This is the second time in three fights that she played spoiler to a big-time favorite. Good for Denise Gomes. Then we had Daniel Marcos and sexy Mexi John Castaneda. And I'm going to take back what I said about Daniel Marcos. My position on Daniel Marcos was that a lot of these fights are closer than they should be. He's not running away with these fights. He's barely squeaking out decisions. He's a low-volume guy that doesn't 
do what he needs to do in some of these fights to get it over the edge. And he has been getting these decisions and he has been winning, obviously because he's undefeated, but we hadn't seen him be the technical beast that he was in this fight. And I think there's two parts to this. One, obviously Daniel Marcos has those skills. He obviously has technical striking. He obviously has pinpoint accuracy. That was there. But the other half of this is somebody like John Castaneda brought it out of him. John Castaneda just moving forward, all gas, staying in his face, working for the legs, coming to the head, and just being there, bringing the fight out of Daniel. And I think this is the best Daniel's ever looked. And John Castaneda had moments. At one point, he Matt Hughes Daniel Marcos above his head and slammed him to the ground. But when they were striking, and when Daniel Marcos was in that flow state, he was touching John Castaneda anywhere he wanted to, whenever he wanted to. Laser pinpoint accuracy. He clearly had some power in the mix. Daniel Marcos looked great in this fight. He looked absolutely spectacular in this fight. So now we know if you bring the fight to him, that may actually bring the best out of him. But if you play that outside game and you dance around, then he'll do that as well. He's almost a match energy kind of fighter. But he looks spectacular in this fight. John Castaneda didn't look terrible either. He was just a step behind. He just was not as good of a striker. It's just that simple. Literally was just not as good of a striker. Because he moved forward. He transitioned from striking to wrestling pretty well. He had a couple of takedowns. He had that big slam takedown. Couldn't do anything with it, but he had it. But Daniel Marcos was just too accurate with the strikes, too powerful. John Castaneda, tough as hell. Daniel Marcos, 16-0. and And maybe he got a gift in that Davy Grant fight, but he earned this win. This was a spectacular win. Daniel Marcos looked absolutely phenomenal. I am going to watch him closely though, because I do think the opponent matters in Daniel Marcos matchups. For example, let's say they do Daniel Marcos and Taylor Lapalus. Taylor Lapalus, a laser pinpoint accurate guy. Daniel Marcos, a laser pinpoint accurate guy. Neither one of them looking to engage. They're both waiting for you to come forward so they can step off and they could do their things. That fight could be a staring contest. That fight could come down to who is actually willing to engage. And I've seen Taylor more willing to engage than Daniel Marcos. Point being here, Daniel Marcos looked absolutely phenomenal. But I think the reason he looked good, the reason we got to see all of his skills is because John Castaneda stayed in his face, got in his face, continued to move forward. And so Daniel was able to work all of those pieces instead of sit back and wait. Either way, it was really fun to watch. Very exciting fight. And I'm curious to see what they do next with Daniel. Honestly, I think I just did the matchmaking. Daniel Marcos and Taylor Lapalus is probably a spectacular next fight for both of them. Then we had an absolute banger. This was an absolute banger. This was the first half of the safety parlay. I needed this to go over two and a half rounds. And honestly, there were several times where it didn't look like it was going to. At one point in time, Montana De La Rosa had like a um, anaconda choke standing that hit the ground and turned into a darse and she rolled through. There was a ton, an absolute ton of back and forth in this fight. Montana De La Rosa moved forward, actually wrestled. She stayed in her face. She threw the strikes. Andrea Lee was also there. Andrea Lee had her own takedown. Andrea Lee was on top a ton, won some scrambles, was winning some striking exchanges. This was a really fun fight. This was an absolute scrap. And you know what the biggest travesty of the night is going to be? That they're not going to get fight of the night bonuses. They should. That was an awesome fight. The back and forth was great. They both were looking to win. They both had the other person in danger more than one time. They both continued to move forward. Neither one of them quit. There should be fight of the night bonuses for these two. But they won't get it. It'll go to some other people on the card, some more popular people, some people higher up on the card. But either way, this was an absolute phenomenal fight. It showed that neither one of these women are done. They could both get wins in the UFC. Andrea Lee, this is now her fourth loss in a row? Or is this her fifth loss in a row? Andrea Lee, this is one, two, three. This is her fifth loss in a row. She is all but cut. There's absolutely no way she doesn't lose her job which is kind of unfortunate because those five losses are quality losses. This was a quality loss. She went out there, she fought her ass off and just didn't get the win. This was an absolutely spectacular fight. Montana De La Rosa, it'd be interesting to see what they do next for her because she's lost some fights she shouldn't have lost. But she is tough. She went back to the wrestling roots and she made it happen. This was an absolutely great fight that brought the best out of both of these women. And then the other half of the safety parlay, the biggest favorite on the card was Brad Katana. In fairness to me, when I put him in the safety parlay a week and a half ago, he wasn't the favor that he ended up closing as. But in that fight, he looked like the favorite he ended up closing as. And I knew that's what that was going to be. Sometimes you just look at a fight and you don't even need to see 
who the A side is. You see the B side. I saw Jesse Butler and I'm like, nah, he's not winning. And immediately was like, boom, we're good here. But Brad Katana won this fight. It wasn't just Jesse Butler not being UFC caliber. Brad Katana moved forward, got the takedowns whenever he wanted to, avoided the danger, landed 2,000 strikes. And Jesse Butler was tall. Any success Jesse had was because he's tall. The guy fought at 170, fought at 155. To come all the way down the fight at 135 is crazy. He made the weight. He looked fine. He didn't slow down. He looked actually great considering he fought at 155 not that long ago. But the success he had was because he is long. And he was able to land a few things here and there, a couple of weird scrambles on the ground. But overall, Brad Katana worked them. So now the question is, how good is Brad Katana? Because the only fight he's lost since winning the Ultimate Fighter, the only fight he's lost recently was that sketchy decision to Garrett Arnfield in his last fight. And in that fight, the striking wasn't going entirely his way, so he transitioned to grappling. He got the takedowns. He got four takedowns in that fight. And in this fight, he got the takedowns. He also won the striking exchanges. Brad Katana is a very well-rounded guy that might not be getting the respect he deserves. He's 14-3. and three. He's won the Ultimate Fighter two times. I am very curious to see if all of a sudden Brad Katana is like sneakily winning fights quietly under the radar. But he looked great in this fight, as he should have. He was a massive favorite, no shocking there. His opponent is probably not UFC caliber. So he did exactly what he was supposed to do, but I think what's impressive is he did exactly what he was supposed to do. How many fighters on this card did not do what they were supposed to do? With six underdogs winning, plenty of fighters didn't do what they were supposed to do. Brad Katana did. He looked absolutely great. I'm looking forward to his next fight. Then we had Carlos Prates doing this fight exactly what he did in his last fight. And that is lose most of the round and then land the strikes. And that might just be who he is at this point. Because Charlie Radke was winning some of those striking exchanges, the early ones. Then Charlie Radke would get Carlos Prates against the cage, a little bit of control time. Couldn't full-blown get a beautiful takedown, but he was slowing the pace. He was getting rid of the distance, holding him against the cage, controlling from there. And then all of a sudden, it, you could just see it. All of a sudden, Carlos Prates is like, nah, I'm throwing. He moved forward. The strikes were landing. And ultimately, that big knee to the body just absolutely did Charlie Racky in. And it is what it is. And this is what was supposed to happen. Charlie Racky was a two-to-one underdog. This is what was supposed to happen, and it did. I think what got me and others excited for Charlie here was just how bad Carlos Prates looked before Trevin Giles overcommitted and got knocked out and this fight was somewhat similar not as dramatic as the last fight because Trevin Giles had a ton of success in that fight and then one punch changed it in this fight Charlie Racky did have early success but the tides turned it wasn't just one knee like the tides were turning and Carlos was starting to take over and then that knee but either way Carlos Prates manages to do it again stays in a striking match makes the strikes happen got it done Charlie Radke, I mean, he moved forward, he fought, he brought the fight to him, just, there's some things you can't tough out, and a knee to the gut like that, when you just can't breathe or can't move, there's nothing you could do there, but Carlos Prates got that win, and uh, looked pretty good the last minute of that fight. Then we have Ludovic Klein, levels above Tiago Moises, just levels above him. This is another fight I had the over two and a half, and at one point in time, it looked pretty sketchy like that wasn't going to hit. But when I talked about Tiago Moises, I believe it was in the Thursday night full card breakdown, we talked about how Tiago Moises is old school. He's only 31 years old, but he has this old fighting style, this previous generation fighting style, where his striking's technical, but it's not good, right? He's in the room putting in the work, but it's not flowy, comfortable striking. Then his takedowns are decent, but his jujitsu is not this modern jujitsu. It's not this like attack style, but stand up when you can type jujitsu. It's not create a scramble jujitsu. It's very, I'm going to say basic, but that's not an insult. I'm not saying basic as in an insult. I'm saying basic as in he's got phenomenal basics. He's got great control. He can do great escapes. He can work his way through the positions very, very well. But if you can't get it to the ground, you're not going to have any success. And if you can't hang out striking, you're not going to have any success. And it was just clear that Ludovic Klein was light years better than Tiago Moises. First of all, he got 
the first takedown he tried just launched Tiago Moises, took him down, no problems at all. Tiago rolled for a knee bar, and for a second there, it looked pretty tight. Ludovic got out of that and didn't matter. And that takedown was just to prove a point. It was just, I'm better than you literally everywhere. And it's unfortunate because a guy like Tiago, who has that jujitsu black belt and is working on his striking, just can't put together those, those special things. Because Tiago's not an athletic guy. He's not a gifted individual. He has earned what he has through hard work. Where Ludovic Klein is a gifted guy. He's clearly very athletic. He's very fluid. He's very smooth. He has incredible striking. The fact that he's learned grappling as quickly as he has is incredible as well. Ludovic Klein looked absolutely spectacular in this fight. I don't know what they're going to do with him next, but there's a lot of really fun matchups at 100. Give him Benoit saint Denis. Although Benoit lost and Ludovic won, but that could be a really fun fight. I mean, this was the toughest matchup that they have given him so far. This is the highest ranked fighter, I believe, that Ludovic has ever fought, the most accomplished fighter that Ludovic has ever fought, and he ran right through with almost no problems whatsoever. And then Punele Soriano looks absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic at welterweight. Guess what the Division Three All-American did in this fight? He wrestled. We had not seen him wrestle in the UFC before. He was a Division Three All-American wrestler. I mention it every single time I break this guy down. I also mention he hasn't used it yet. And when this fight was booked and when this was on paper, when I broke it down, I said, I don't understand how a guy who hasn't fought in two years, who's coming off two knockout losses in a row, three losses in a row total, is a two to one favorite. I don't understand it. So I picked Punaheli to win. And Punaheli came out here and made it look like Miguel Baeza hasn't fought in two years. Made it look like... He's coming off three losses in a row. Punaheli Soriano looked fantastic. Outside of that, that locked up knee bar slash heel hook back to the knee bar, outside of that, Punaheli looked fantastic. And even inside of that, he looked good. He was controlled. It didn't look like he was going to tap at any point. He was blasting Miguel Baez's face. And I do think layoffs matter quite a bit. So a couple things here. Punaheli at 170 pounds looks excellent. The fact that he went back to his wrestling is fantastic. You spent your whole life wrestling. You did it in college. You accomplished things. As a wrestler in college, why did you abandon it in fist fights? So it is absolutely great to see him go to his wrestling. That's just at a completely new wrinkle that wasn't there before this fight. And I think layoffs matter. Miguel just seemed to step behind, especially in the striking. Punaheli Soriano, curious what they do for him at 170 pounds. He looked great. This was a fantastic decision for his career. And the only fan fades stay alive. So if you don't know what the only fans fade is, there's several women in the UFC that are only fans models. And some of them are more successful than others. Aileen Perez, for example, big time only fan model. And she is successful in the octagon. But for the most part, we have a whole bunch that are not. A whole bunch of fighters. Kay Hansen, for example. Hannah Goldie, for example. Jessica Panay, for example. And people over time have begun to fade these women. They're so focused on the extracurriculars that they clearly weren't doing what they needed to do to get wins inside the octagon. Again, it's not everybody, but there was a theme for a while. Julian Marquez falls squarely within that theme. He is an OnlyFans guy. And he's not an OnlyFans guy like, you know, Demetrius Johnson is, where they sponsor him to do non-smut content so that they can bring other eyes to the platform. No, 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 no. He's doing the stuff. And this guy didn't last a minute. Didn't last one minute. Listen, I had been let down in the past by Zach Reese. Zach Reese was in a safety parlay. The, the very last time I ever did a safety parlay with a UFC debut, Zach Reese ruined that for everybody. He was in the safety parlay. And then Cody Brundage bounced his head off the floor, and that was the end of that. And I said, never again am I putting a UFC debut in there. But I still believed in him. I believed in him coming into this fight. I knew he still had power. I knew he still had all those tools. All those skills and all those tools that I picked him against Cody Brunish were still there. Plus Julian Marquez being gone for a year, getting TKO'd standing, doing the OnlyFans stuff. It just made sense to me that Zach Reese was going to win this fight. Did I think Zach Reese was going to win this fight that quickly? No. 20 seconds into the first round. I did not think it was going to go down like that, but it did. The guy is massive for this weight class. He has insane power. He absolutely uncorks 
But I do think we need to see another win from him before we can say, okay, Zach Reese is very good, or was this just Julian Marquez is done? When you get a 20-second knockout, you really don't learn a lot from that. It's hard to take the winner of a 20-second knockout and be like, that guy is phenomenal. Obviously, in that moment, that one single strike, sure. But really, that was a perfect strike that landed at the perfect time on the perfect guy. I am still a Zach Reese guy. I picked him to win this fight. He did win this fight as an underdog. But I don't know how much of it was Zach Reese and how much was it Julian Marquez and his chin and his extracurricular careers and all that stuff. But either way, great win for Zach Reese. And what a wild knockout Bruno Fajeda had. What a wild knockout Bruno Fajeda had. This was an awesome fight. Bruno Fajeda and Dustin Stolzfus went at it. Dustin worked in a few takedowns and it was like, oh boy, Bruno's going to gas, he's going to fade, and he was fading, and he was gassing, but he didn't stop. He continued to work. He was just breathing heavy while doing it. He continued to work. He continued to bomb away. He knew he could knock out Dustin Stolfus and didn't quit on that. So on one hand, that was a sloppy mess. Just bombing away, headhunting. Sloppy, sloppy mess. There's no way he trains like that. You don't train just closing your eyes and swinging wild. But he was taken down. He worked his way back up. He was exhausted. He kept swinging. He had Dustin Stolzfus on the ropes more than one time. And then ultimately a spinning back elbow right here in this picture directly to the chin to get it done. And that was incredible. I literally stood up and whoa. I was at a pool party watching the fights on their TV. Everybody else is drinking and doing stuff. And I'm standing up watching the fights and I'm just whoa, making noises all of a sudden. Everybody looked over. This was a spectacular knockout by Bruno. And if you watched him celebrate, I don't want to say he was surprised, but like that was a celebration of somebody who was a five to one underdog and pulled off an upset. He was like crying, couldn't believe he won. And that's great. I'm glad he did that. I think maybe I don't, you know, I could be wrong. Who knows? Maybe he dedicated it to his cat that ran away. I don't know. But I think those emotions was because he was done. I think he was exhausted. He was done. I think in his head, he's like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And then ultimately he pushed through and he pulled it off. And then that was just the raw emotion leaving his body. But either way, Bruno Fajeda remains a wildly dangerous guy, but he will lose to anybody durable. If you're durable and you have cardio, Bruno Fajeda will lose. He was fading against Stolzfus and he pushed through and he got it done. But Stoltzfus is one of the chinniest guys at 185 pounds. This was the case. We said sometimes one plus one does equal two. Bruno Fajeda has power. Dustin Stoltzfus has no chin. Should equal Bruno Fajeda knockout. And it shockingly did, considering how many other things in this card did not go according to formula. And then we had a tale of two fights. On the left-hand side, it's a little cut off there, but on the left-hand side, Ricky Tercios almost has Raul Rosas Jr. submitted. He has the rear naked choke. He has his back. He's the one squeezing the life out of him. And on the right-hand side is the actual finish of this fight where Raul Rosas Jr. ends up in a rear naked choke and then finishing Ricky Tercios. This was an incredible back and forth fight. This is the fight that I thought it was going to be. I ultimately picked Raul to win, but I didn't bet on him because I said I'm just worried about Ricky and how scrappy he is. I'm worried about the pace that Ricky can set and how crazy he can make fights on the ground. His scramble skills are unbelievable. He never stops. High volume, high pace. The guy just never stops moving. And we saw that. He had Raul Rosas Jr. in the most amount of trouble we've seen him in. We've seen, we saw Raul lose a fight. We saw him lose a fight. But when he lost that fight to C-Rod, it didn't look like this. He wasn't almost finished. He was just exhausted, doing nothing, getting pushed around. In this fight, he was almost finished. Very close to being finished, in fact. But he did show some tenacity. He's only 19 years old. He's improving at an incredible rate. And he showed us that he can gut things through. He will not quit on himself. And he was able to get out get his own half a shot to back take and then get a rear naked choke of his own. And it looked great. So great win for Aru Rosas Jr. Phenomenal win. He earned it. But it is interesting because he is sloppy. He is sloppy. At the end of the day, he's sloppy. Ricky Tershos isn't like unbelievable. He's just busy. So to be in this position, not a great look. 
And I am curious to see what the next level of competition looks like for him because he lost to C-Rod. Then he knocked out a dude that hasn't looked great in the UFC. And then he almost got submitted in this fight. So Raul Rosas Jr. won by submission, but there was a lot of adversity along the way. And if the UFC wants him to be a star, they want him to be this, this Mexican prospect, this young guy growing up in the octagon, doing all the things, they need to be careful with the matchups because he is sloppy and he can be exposed at times. And we saw that earlier in this fight. Then we had the co-main event of the evening. First, we'll give Dominic Reyes his credit. Uh, this picture says everything. He knocked out Dustin Jacoby. That is Dustin Jacoby falling face first, head down on the mat. But before we uh, do a parade and shoot off the cannons and the balloons and the ticker tape and all of that, Dominic Reyes is still chinny. He was on Wobble Street by Dustin Jacoby, and Dustin Jacoby's not a power guy. Dustin Jacoby had him wobbled. The reason Dustin Jacoby ended up face planted is because he was landing. He was connecting. He had Dominic Reyes in a little bit of trouble and he just kept moving forward. Wasn't worried about defense anymore because he was worried about offense. And there was an aspect to this as well where Dominic Reyes, it seemed like he was a little nervous about his own chin because he got hit and he's like, oh God, all right, I'm still here. Oh, I'm still here. And maybe he needed that. Maybe he needed to get hit hard a few times, feel it a little bit but not get knocked out cold to be like, oh boy, I'm still in this. So what Dominic Reyes showed us is that he is a massive human being that still has power and there's some chin in there. That's what he showed us. And I don't know what his next matchup is. He said in his post-fight speech, I'm the best light heavyweight on the planet. That's, uh, that's, not, that's not what I saw. And obviously me saying that with this picture next to my head seems like an outrageous thing to say. But that's not, I did not see the best light heavyweight on the planet. What I saw was a very large guy that got hit a few times and then ended up landing the harder shots toward the ends of the fight. That's what I saw. I am glad that Dominic Reyes won. I'm glad he won. I want new life in this division. I want these divisions to have plot lines and themes and things to discuss and talk about. Dustin Jacoby, you know, unfortunately, he's been on a couple of highs and lows recently. Dominic Reyes, at least at one point in time, fought for the belt, arguably won it. So while he had an all-time downward spiral after that, this little tick back up in the right direction, this little win, all of a sudden looks pretty good. If Jamal Hill gets knocked out by Carlos Ulberg, why don't we do Jamal Hill and Dominic Reyes? Why don't we do that? There are some really good matchups here for Dominic Reyes still. I am not all aboard that hype train just yet. I don't think one win undoes what we saw because even in this fight, it seemed to me like he got hit. He was a little out of sorts for a minute, but he was able to pull it off. So congratulations to Dominic Reyes. I am glad that he got the win. It is better for the division for somebody like him to win. I'm curious what they do for his next matchup. I really do think they should just, let's see what happens with the Jamal Hill fight. Let's just see what happens there. And then that could be a really cool matchup. Jamal Hill on a two-fight skid. Dominic Reyes just breaking a three-fight skid. No, a four-fight skid. Three? Four? Whatever it is. Yeah, three knockout, four-fight skid. That could be a ton of fun. And then we had the main event of the evening. Couple of things. Horrible stoppage. Horrible stoppage. If you didn't watch, Kevin Herzog stopped this fight in the fourth round while Jared Cannonier was standing with his hands up defending himself. Just stopped it. Bad, bad stoppage. Let's talk about some of the good, though. Both Nasruddin Imovov and Jared Cannonier looked very good at different points in time, but they both looked very good. Jan and Cannonier looked great early. It was just a continuation of his last fight. Busy forward pressure, lots of strikes, lots of cage control, takedown attempts, just busy, busy, busy. And that version of Jared, the busy Jared, the one moving forward, shooting takedowns, the one who landed the significant strike record or set that record in his last fight, that guy was having success early in this fight. And he looked good. And then there were just glimpses of Imovov landing clean. Just glimpses of it. But once we hit the late third round, the fourth round, Nasruddin started to take over. Jared Kennedy's corner said, you cannot do the boxing guard. You need to move your feet. You cannot be in one place for very long. And we saw why. Because Nasruddin Imovov will land, will land clean, and will land with power. And he absolutely had Jared Cannonier rocked. 
Without question, Jared Cannonier was rocked. Without question. Should this have been stopped? Absolutely not. If he didn't stop it, was Jared going to survive? I don't know. I don't know. It might have been stopped in 30 seconds from then without question, right? The next shot might have just put him out completely. But when it was stopped in the main event, a guy as durable as Jared Cannonier, a guy who has fought for the title, a guy that was doing well in this fight, he could have won a decision. He could have won a decision. He could have banked the first three rounds, lost the fourth, more of the same, lost the fifth, and won a decision. And that was taken away from him. And that is unfortunate. That is unfortunate because it's one thing when Dustin Jacoby got face planted and then he contested like, what? It's another thing for Jared Cannonier to contest it. You could even see, I know this is a picture and it's hard to tell, but you can tell he has his wits about him right here. Like what? What? It was a very bad stoppage, but I don't want that to take away the good that both of these guys did. Nasser Dean was able to weather a storm. He was outworked, but didn't get frustrated, didn't quit on himself. Jared Cannonier was able to move forward, was able to shoot the takedowns, able to stay busy, able to put in the work. And I wish we had that version of Jared Cannonier at 35. We get him now at 40. And ultimately, the age is the problem. The chin's the first thing that goes. And I don't know, if he was 28, maybe the same shots would have wobbled him. But at 40, they certainly did. The chin is the first thing that goes, and that might have been him showing his age. Either way, guys, that's how I saw these fights. Let me know what you think. Do you think this was that bad of a stoppage? Or are you in the camp of like, listen, nothing was going to change. In the, in the next 30 seconds, nothing was going to change. Sure, it was a couple seconds early, but nothing was going to change. It's all good. He's there to protect people. And for all we know, Jason Herzog just added a few years to Jared Cannonier's career. I don't know, guys, but let me know what you thought. The UFC Vegas 93 picks and bets are up right now if you want to check those out. And if you want 50 bucks, I will send you $50. Just go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Sign up with any one of our betting partners. Make a deposit. We send you 50 bucks. It's affiliate marketing. You're going to use the link. You're going to sign up. They're going to pay me. I'm going to whap, slice off some of that money, and I'm going to give it right back. To you, you can then use that money to become a premium member. Safety Parlay hit this event. It hit last event. Safety Parlay overall hits at almost a 70% event win rate. The lifetime return on investment on the Safety Parlay is 25%. You're also going to get the line movement tracker. Detailed data metrics and analytics. You're going to get picks and bets, the DraftKings optimizer, tools, the best DraftKings owner projections in the game. You're going to get everything you have ever wanted or needed heading into a fight week. UFC Vegas 93 is up and ready to go. If you're not a premium member, just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It is only $10. That $10 will get you UFC Vegas 93. It'll get you UFC Saudi Arabia, UFC 303. It's an entire month. Wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top.